गोपी जाना वाला बागिरी बार जारे गिरवार जा या सोरा नंदा ना प्रजा जाना रंजना Yaso da nanda na praja jana randa na Yamuna tira vana chari Yamuna tira vana chari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Kunja Bihari Jaya Gopi Chanda Vallabha Giri Vardhari Yasoda Nanda Na Praja Jana Randa Na Yamuna Tira Vana Chari Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama Rama, Rama, Hare Hare Jaya Raja, Madhava Raja, Madhava Shri Dare Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada, Prabhupada, Shila Prabhupada. Shila Prabhupada ki jai, Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai. Nitai go premanandi hari hari bol. So this evening we are reading from Bhagavad Gita, chapter two, contents of the Gita summarized, text fifteen. Yamhina vyata yantiete. Purusham purusha shaba. Samadukha sukham diram Somitatvaya kalpate Yamhina vyata yantya ete Purusham purusha shava Samadukha sukham diram Somitatvaya kalpate 
Please sit chant. Yam hina vyata yantyete Purusham purusha shabha Sama dukha sukham diram Somitat vaya kalpate Yam hina vyata yantyete Purusham purusha shabha Samadukha sukham diram Somitat vaya kalpate Yam hina vyata yantyete Purusha purusha shabha Samadukha sukham diram Somitat vaya kalpate Yam hina vyata yantyete Purusham purusha shabha Sama dukha sukham diram Somitat vaya kalpate Yam One to whom? He Certainly Na Never Vyata yanti are distressing. Ete, all these. Purusham, to a person. Purusha, Rishaba. O best among men. Sama, unalterated. Dukkha, in distress. Sukham, and happiness. Diram, patient. Sa, he, Amritadvaya, for liberation, Kalpate, is considered eligible. Translation and purport by Srila Prabhupada. O best among men, Arjuna, the person who is not disturbed by happiness and distress and is steady in both is certainly eligible for liberation. Please repeat. O best among men, Arjuna, the person who is not disturbed by happiness and distress and is steady in both is certainly eligible for liberation. Purport. Anyone who is steady in his determination for the advanced stage of spiritual realization and can equally tolerate the onslaughts of distress and happiness is certainly a person eligible for liberation. In the Vanashram institution, the fourth stage of life, namely the, rena the renounced order, sannyas, is a painstaking situation. But one who is serious about making his life perfect surely adopts the sannyas order of life in spite of all difficulties. The difficulties usually arise from having to sever family relationships, to give up the connection of wife and children. But if anyone is able to tolerate such difficulties, surely his path to spiritual realization is complete. Similarly, in Arjuna's discharge of duties as a Kshatriya, he is advised to persevere, even if it is difficult to fight with his family members or similarly beloved persons. Lord Chaitanya took sannyas at the age of 24, and his dependent young wife as well as his old mother had no one else to look after them. Yet for a higher cause, he took sannyas and was steady in the discharge of higher duties. That is the way of achieving liberation from material bondage. O maginati mirandas yagananjana shalakaya chakshun militam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha shri chaitanya manobhistam stapitam yena bhutale Svayam rupa gadamayam dadati svapadantikam 
ವಂದೇಹಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರು ಶ್ರೀಯುತ ಪರಕಮಲಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುನ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವಂಶ ಶ್ರೀರೂಪ ಸಾಗಜಾಥ ಸಹಗನ ರಘುನಥ ವಿಥಂ ತಂ ಸಜೀವ ಸಾಧ್ವೈತ ಸಾವಧೂತ ಪರಿಜನ ಸಹಿತ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ದೇವ ಶ್ರೀರಾಧಾಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪದನ್ ಸಾಗನ ಲಲಿತ ಶ್ರೀ ವಿಶಖನ್ ವಿಥಂಶ ಹೈ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರುಣ ಸಿಂಧು ದೀನಬಂಧು ಜಗತ್ಪಥೆ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗೋಪಿಕಾ ಕಂಠ ರಾಧಕಂಠ ನವೋಸ್ತುಥೆ ತಪ್ತ ಕಂಚನ ಗೋರಂಗೆ ರಾಧೆ ಬೃಂದಾವನೀಶ್ವರೆ ವೃಷಭಾನು ಸುಧೇ ದೇವಿ ಪ್ರಾಣಮಿ ಹರಿ ಪ್ರಿಯ ವಂಶಕಲ್ಪತರೂಪ್ಯ ಕೃಪಸಿಂಧುಭ್ಯ ಪಥಿತನ ಭವಾನೇಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗಧ ಶಿವಸರಿ ಗೌರಭಕ್ತ ಬೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸೊ yesterday we heard matras pashas to konteya shitoshna sukadukada agama payino nityas tam sitikshashvabarata ha the d- discussion was about the non permanent appearance of happiness and distress and how they come and go just like summer and winter season so today the topic goes one step further that if somebody can understand that this material world in in this material world inevitably we will experience happiness and distress it's unavoidable because it's been arranged in that way and that was all explained yesterday so here a uh, krishna is encouraging arjuna if you're not disturbed by this onslaught of happiness and distress if you can stay equal po- equipoised not disturbed and steady you become eligible for liberation liberation meaning here eligible for pure devotional service actually you are eligible on your path home back to godhead so that's a that's a big step you know that's a big um it's very good news it's very encouraging it's very optimistic um and it gives us a, a sense of purpose in this life because generally when we're experiencing happiness or distress you know we get so caught up the interesting thing is that happiness and distress both words are on an equal platform generally we're looking for happiness if we're feeling some happiness we don't complain you know then everything is fine if there's some distress then we're disturbed but actually here Krishna is saying both be free from happiness and distress in this material world because they just lead to entanglement. Now Srila Prabhupada comes to a very serious topic and um, I was thinking, oh Krishna, why it comes just when I have to give Bhagavad Gita class this topic of sanyas you know it's a, it's not an easy thing to discuss actually and it's a very serious topic but here some key points are important to note first of all prophets is if you're serious about spiritual life you must take to the renounced order or sanyas he's saying that If you want to make your life perfect you should adopt this sanyas order despite all difficulties and then he explains the dip what are these difficulties he's saying the difficulties usually arise from having to sever family relationships you know to give up your connection with wife and children now why is that difficult because actually we're all seeking happiness and generally in a family situation there's a lot of affection and loving dealings and of course 
attachment, concern, care, you know, these, these are all natural emotions that we have in any family situation. However, and it's, it, what I meant to say was I actually had to go through this myself in my life. You know, like we can speak, we can speak theoretically so many things about the Shastra and Slokas and this and that. But actually going through the experience where, uh, you know, 17 years ago, my then husband took to the renounced order of life after 20 years of marriage. It was a huge change. And for myself, I've been educated in Krishna consciousness and I'm reading Srimad Bhagavatam and I, and I have the education of my spiritual master. I was able to come through this transition, but it was not easy. It was very difficult. Prabhupada says here, if you're, if, you're, if you're able to tolerate those difficulties, it is definitely a difficult transition then you become eligible for liberation from material bondage. So it's not an easy task. So I can speak a little bit from my own experience that I just wanted to say, especially for us coming from the Western countries, where this Varnashram system, especially taking to the renounced order of life, it's just not part of the culture. Actually, generally, all over the world, here in India also, the encouragement is, you're, and you're a successful person, if you've made nice family arrangements, you're taking well care of your family, your children, your wife, your parents, you're nicely situated, you know, you have four properties over there, you're buying land over there, this one is an engineer, that one is a doctor, and like that. And that is what is considered success. And this is what is applauded. And this is what is being educated. So even in our ISKCON movement, uh, we, are, we are trying to understand what Srila Prabhupada is saying here. And many of our men have taken this very seriously to heart and have taken to the sannyas order. However, we have to remember the the dependence, the family dependence left behind, there may be some serious trauma. There may be some serious confusion. Uh, there may be even mental health issues because there's this feeling of abandonment, this feeling of rejection. And uh, so if anybody wants to take this step, he has to seriously think it over and take care and put things into place that uh, people can accept, at least accept and respect and understand why you're doing and also the process of how you're making that transition from family life to sannyas uh, that it's done under guidance. This is just a little bit from my own experience that I wanted to share. Interestingly enough, in other pla many other places, I just found one uh, here in Krishna book, prayers offered by Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma says, the best process for understanding you is to submissively give up the speculative process and try to hear about you, either from yourself as you have given statements in the Bhagavad Gita and many similar Vedic scriptures, or from a realized devotee who has taken shelter at your lotus feet. One has to hear from a devotee without speculation. One does not even need to change his worldly position. He simply has to hear your message. Although you are not understandable by the material senses, simply by hearing about you, one can gradually conquer the nations of misunderstanding. So just to balance the scale, in many places Srila Prabhupada speaks very strongly. Yes, definitely, like I think it's, 
In Srimad Bhagavatam, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, also where he says, age 50 years, it's compulsory to take sannyas. He speaks very strongly in that way. However, in many other places you can research, he actually says there's no need to change your position. The important thing is to hear. Because what is the purpose of sannyas? We come to that in a moment. Like uh, in Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th canto, 14th chapter, text 3, a very famous verse actually, particularly one line gets quoted a lot, where it says, Stane stita shrutikadham tanuvan manubhya, which means there's no need to change your position, but man must hear the transcendental sound vibration of Krishna Kata. I just read the translation. Those who, even while remaining situated in their established social positions, so you can remain in your whatever ashram you're in, or social position, like uh, Arjuna, he's a kshatriya. Krishna never told him to give up his position as kshatriya, but he wanted to ch transform his consciousness. He knew Arjuna had some ignorance, so he needed him to hear. So the important thing is to hear before we can do anything. Tattva, Harikata, like that. Those who even while remaining situated in their established social positions throw away the process of speculative knowledge and with their body, words and minds offer all respects to descriptions of your personality and activities dedicating their lives to these narrations which are vibrated by you personally and by your pure devotees, certainly conquer your lordship, although you are otherwise unconquerable by anyone within the three worlds. It's a very beautiful verse. You know how, so what does it mean, sannyas? Sannyas means to completely uh, give your, yourself to Krishna, fully surrender to Krishna. To conquer Krishna. So how to conquer Krishna is actually to hear his words. Like we're hearing Bhagavad Gita, directly the words of God, which is amazing. You know, there are many other scriptures in the world, but this is the only scripture where we can clearly say it emanated from the mouth of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which is amazing. So hearing the words of God or hearing from his pure devotee, you conquer the unconquerable Lord. And the idea is that by this hearing, we're learning the science of Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada says in other places too, no need to leave your family, but you need to train them nicely in Krishna consciousness, you chant Hare Krishna together, you follow the four regulative principles, but if you cannot do that, if the situation is unfavorable for you to chant Hare Krishna and follow the four regulative principles, then you must abandon that situation. So the, the, the purpose, obviously, the goal, is that we achieve you know, love for Krishna. And by hearing, we learn how to surrender ourselves and how to, like Rupa Goswami says, reawaken that love that's already lying dormant in our heart for Krishna. So that is the goal. So we're having that goal in mind, then we can make a decision about our ashram and what it needs to be done. Because we also know in uh, Nectar of Devotion, you know, Prabhupada speaks about Falgu Vairagya and Makata Vairagya, that, uh, you know, you can look as if you're very renounced, but actually underneath there's so, so many material desires still uh, uh, lurking in the heart. So the idea is um, to become purified, to hear uh, the words of God, Guru's words, and become purified. 
Mayavadis, I was reading Prabhupada says, Mayavadis, impersonalists, they get this very confused. They think that all activities in this material world are mundane, are material, and therefore needs to be rejected. Sometimes I've also seen in our movement, um, you know, some very uh, wrong and false ideas of what means renunciation. Renunciation doesn't mean to give up activities. Actually, we do the same activities, but we do them for Krishna. And then also in Nectar of Devotion, Rupa Goswami explains any activity, you know, even Srila Prabhupada, he was moving around, buying paper, going to the printing press, selling magazines, doing so many things, traveling on airplanes. And they, they seem to be like ordinary activities like any other businessman would do. But they're not. They're transcendental activities because they're connected with Krishna. That's the difference. We don't need to be like a yogi, you know, locking ourselves in some cave in the Himalayas and, you know, be free from all material activities in that way, become liberated. No, that's a misunderstanding. Actually, that's the beauty of Krishna consciousness, that whatever we have, we just need to connect that to Krishna. So again, this hearing process is the process for becoming Krishna conscious. And hearing process means I hear and I submit, I surrender. I have to have a mood of surrender. That means I have to have a mood of whatever I'm hearing, I need to apply. I have to feel there's a change of heart. In regards to um, how everything becomes uh, transcendental, as soon as it's connected with Krishna, there's this beautiful verse. I just had to bring that up even so it's not directly related to the topic, but it's so sweet. It's in the first canto, chapter 11, text 2. There's a description of Krishna's conch shell, and, it's, and there's a nice painting of that too, so I can just visualize the picture. It's very nice. The white and fat boweled conch shell being gripped by the hand of Lord Krishna and sounded by him, appeared to be reddened by the touch of his transcendental lips. It seemed that a white swan was playing in the stems of red lotus flowers. It's very sweet. It's a very beautiful description. So here's an ordinary conch shell, apparently, but... This conch shell is so lucky, it's getting touched by the lips of the Lord and it's taking on the reddish hue, the reddish color of Krishna's lips. And this is to show that this is now a transcendental activity. The blowing of the conch, the sound that's coming from this conch is um, you know, announcing victory. In the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, we hear about that how uh, before the battle, everybody blew their conch. And uh, the demons, the enemies, of course, for them, their fear increased. And for the devotee, the, the feeling of uh, victory, joy, uh, happiness, shelter uh, came. So there's a spiritual significance, you know, of our activities connected with Krishna. In short, and I'll come in a moment more to this sannyas, but what I try to convey tonight is this Krishna consciousness movement is so beautiful and it is scientific and it's so accessible and anybody and everywhere in the whole world can apply it and get the full benefit. And this is what makes it so unique. There is a story in uh, Chaitanya Bhagavat where um, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he had, he had gone to Gaya to do his uh, father's Shraddha ceremony. And of course, while he was there, he came in contact with his spiritual master, Ishvara Puri. Now, by that contact, somehow or other, the mood, the character, 
the personality, the attitude, everything completely changed in Mahaprabhu. So when he came back to uh, Navadvip, all the devotees, they were amazed. What had happened? He's no longer this arrogant pundit, you know, arguing with everybody. He's so humble. He just wants to serve the devotees. He's always chanting Hare Krishna, glorifying Krishna. He's dancing and dancing and chanting and falling unconscious. And they were just amazed. So they, when he came back, they met up in Suklambara's house and even Gadadha, Gadadha Pandit came and a few of the other intimate devotees were there and they were just chanting and again and again and it's this this heart-rendering description of how the Lord was dancing and chanting and fell to the ground quite forcefully again and again, but somehow or other uh, he never got hurt. He never, uh, n nothing ever happened to him. So at that time he spoke three verses which... Um, It's very interesting. I thought it was very interesting. Three verses he spoke. I just, we know it from Nectar of Devotion. We learn it there. I'm just looking it up in the book so, to make sure I get the translation correct because it's a long cor translation. But two very, very famous verses when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in admiration of the Vaishnavas, you know, recognizing their qualities, he spoke, Savo padi vinya muktam tat parat vena niyamalam rishikena rishikesha sevanam bhakti uchate. He spoke that verse. Then he said, I just give the translation, because this is so interesting. This is what I mean, Krishna consciousness is so un unique. Bhakti, or devotional service, means engaging all our senses in the service of the Lord. So whatever we have, we have these senses, we don't need to renounce them, we don't artificially suppress them. We just need to use them, whatever we have, in Krishna's service. In the service of the Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the master of all the senses. You know, it doesn't matter if you're Indian, you're Russian, you're American, you're from this, you're that country, this gender, this education. Whatever you have, it's fine. When the spirit soul, and this is what happens, so you use your senses and you engage them in Krishna's service. So when the spirit soul renders service unto the Supreme, there are two side effects. One is freed from all material designations because that was described here as one of the difficulties, right? The problem in the material world is this I, I, mine, mine, my wife, my children, my house, my car. This is all based on false designations. Actually, nothing belongs to us. Everything belongs to the Lord. And it's just whatever we have is just on loan. And whatever we have, we need to use for Krishna. So there are two side effects. One is freed from all material des designations. I'm not the husband. I'm not the wife. I'm Krishna's servant. Krishna does. And simply by being employed in the service of the Lord, one's senses are purified. So if you're in a family situation, you're engaging in Krishna consciousness, and you have other family members who are not engaged in Krishna consciousness, this is where the problem comes. Because you're following, you're practicing, your senses are being purified, and you're naturally getting some kind of mood of detachment because you're identifying yourself as the servant of the Lord. Your meditation is on the lotus feet of the Lord. And then whatever difficulties come, you can tolerate because your meditation is on Krishna and you know Krishna will help you whatever comes, whatever difficulties come up. There's no uh, um, 
Abhaya Ashoka Amrita Bhakti Vinata says at the lotus feet of the Lord there's no fear, there's no lamentation, there's not even death. The material world actually we were speaking yesterday about happiness and distress. The happiness and distress is just a mental perception of any given situation really. And it's based on so much lamentation. Oh, I wished I was young again. Oh, I wished I had money, especially the money. So much we're meditating. Oh, if I had some this amount of money, then I could solve this problem and then this and I can make them happy and like that. So we're constantly riding waves of lamentation in the material world. So if, but if we're engaging ourselves in Krishna service, we're becoming purified from all these different designations, ignorance, illusions, misconceptions. Then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says the next verse. Anya bilashita sunyam jnana kama gnavitam anukulyena krishnanu shilanam bhaktiya uttama. He's saying, when first class devotional service develops, one must be devoid of all material desires. So a devotee is free from all material desires or knowledge obtained by monistic philosophy. He's, he's not interested in speculating about the truth. He knows what is the truth because he hears from Shastra, he hears from Guru. So there's no misconception. One of the anatas, Bhaktivinoda Thakur lists four anatas, and one of them is called Tatvavi Brahma, or misconceptions of the absolute truth. Krishna says later in the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, he says, Jamma Tame Divyam Evam Yo Veti Tatvataha. That one who knows me in truth never has to take birth again. So it's very important if we want to make advancement in Krishna consciousness that we know the truth, that we know Krishna in truth. That is what the, is the issue. Not so much which ashram. Of course, it helps. Naturally, if you're so distracted in family life and job and earning money and this and that, it's very difficult to focus on. It can be very difficult, challenging to focus on Krishna consciousness. But that's the whole point, is to uh, know Krishna in truth. So, and, so here are just... Uh, by, and fruit, he's free from speculative knowledge and fruitive action. The devotee must constantly serve Krishna favorably as Krishna desires. So here again, uh, Krishna is encouraging, well, he's telling, he's ordering. Actually, he's ordering in Bhagavad Gita, he's demanding, Sava, Dhamma, and Parijaja, give up all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me. Manmana, Bhava, Mahapakta. He wants you to always think of Krishna. So to have that faith, to have that faith, if I endeavor for that, that I try my best every day to only think of Krishna, surely Krishna will take care of me. That's the challenge. Prabhupada is speaking about painstaking situation because we're used to getting comforts from our wife, reassurance, confirmations, affirmations. Oh, my husband, he's taking care, he's make, being responsible, he's making decisions. My children will support me and love me and care for me in my old age. We're having all these uh, hopes and expectations. And to just give that up and have that faith, actually it's Krishna that is protecting, that is providing everything. So that takes... Um, quite a leap. So then, let me see, <laughs> I slipped up. I didn't bring the translation to this next verse that, um, and unfortunately it's not in this book. The next verse that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, recites in Suklambara's house is a famous verse spoken by Madhavendra Puri, especially at the time of him leaving the body. You know, uh, maybe you know it, maybe you can help me. Ayi Dina Dayadranata He, that verse, you've surely heard of it, where he's speaking in uh, deep f 
feeling of separation of the Lord. He's crying to the Lord. Of course, that he has two disciples, Ishvara Puri and Ramachandra Puri. And uh, Ramachandra is chastising his guru. Why are you crying? Why are you carrying on? You Now you're leaving this world. You should just focus and not be sentimental. And his guru actually rejected him. And he accepted Ishvara Puri, who then became the spiritual master of Lord Chaitanya, uh, to take care of him. So this verse that Madhavendra Puri is speaking in deep separation of the Lord gives us the mood of what we need to develop, especially if we are thinking, if you're claiming to, co uh, to come to the sannyas order. My revered spiritual master, Srila Gorgovinda Swami, he said, the qualification to take sannyas is Krishna Prema. Actually, he says, you have, it really can only be justified if you're having, if you know to develop this um, feeling of separation for the Lord. Really wanting to uh, submit yourself 100%. There's a beautiful magazine, Sri Krishna Katamrita, and this issue number nine, it speaks. The Secret of Gora's Sanyas Leela. And there, just I'll give a few quotes. It's a beautiful magazine if you want to learn, you know, to learn more about what it means actually to be sanyas. Because on one side we hear Srila Prabhupada saying no need to change your position. And then on the other side he's speaking very strongly, yes, you have to take sanyas. So what is the definition of sanyas? Sat Nyasa or sannyas. This is the combination. Sat means the supreme, the ever existing, and nyasa means renunciation. That means one who has renounced everything for serving the supreme. He is real sannyas. He may take this dress or not, that doesn't matter. Anyone, this is the important sentence here. Anyone who has sacrificed his life for the service of the Supreme Lord, he is a sannyasi. So that is the issue. What are the qualifications to take sannyas? These are just some questions that have been posed to Srila Prabhupada. Who has no more material desires, he is fit for taking sannyas. This is really so important because you might get swept up in the moment of enthusiasm and you might be really genuine and sincere, but then later maybe different desires suddenly come poking up again and you might get bewildered. So this, this fact of being free from material desires is a huge task. Savo padi, anya bilashita sunyam. Sunyam means zero. All material desires made into zero, then sannyas. No more desire for material enjoyment. He is fit for sannyas. Anyone who sees, oh, this car is very nice, a beautiful woman is very nice, he should not think of taking sannyas. This was on a morning walk conversation in Mayapur. So different, different questions are being posed to Srila Prabhupada. And we know the example for us, of course, is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Again, it's, it's a very difficult pastime. It's a very difficult thing to understand how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, at the age of only 24, that's very young, practically still in boyhood, you know, 24 is just a young, young adult not even an adult yet at that age. And he's taking sannyas and Vishnu Priya, his wife who he'd only just married, was only a 14-year-old girl. So it's very difficult to understand why he did that, why it seems very extreme and like Prabhupada is saying here and left his old mother, his young wife, why did he do it? 
So we know that uh, this Krishna consciousness is actually only possible to achieve by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy. And his mood was that he wanted to give the opportunity to everyone. And he knew that many didn't give him the proper respect to be able to receive this bhakti. And, you know, thereby very quickly come to the platform of Krishna consciousness. So his reasoning was, if I take sannyas, because automatically everybody gives respect to a sannyasi, then I can achieve my purpose. So that was one reason. That was his external reason why he took, um, you know, because he came in that mood of a devotee as Bhakta Bhav Angikari. He was in that mood of being a devotee, not in the mood of the Supreme Lord. So he wanted to give this Krishna consciousness to everyone by personally teaching Bhakti. And <clears throat> so to get the respect, you know, even for, of many people who uh, just argued with him or run away or he couldn't reach, he took this sannyas. And so many things are being explained here, which is very nice. But I just, like here, it tells a little bit about Vishnu Priya's japa. I mean, she was just crying nonstop. Vishnu Priya Devi was 14 years old when the Lord left home and took sannyas. After the Lord left, it is said that with the exception of taking bath daily in the Ganga, along with Mother Sachi, Vishnu Priya always remained within the house. When devotees went there to take prasadam, they would only see Vishnu Priya's feet. They ne never did they see her face, nor hear her voice. A constant flow of tears continually streamed from her eyes. She ate only the remnants of food left by Mother Sachi, and constantly chanted the holy name. She worshipped a deity of Lord Goranga and offered service to it with great love and devotion. After the departure of Sachi Devi, her brother acted as her guardian. Srila Narahari Chakravati describes Vishnupriya's suffering and separation from the Lord in his Bhakti Ratnaka as follows. Due to separation from the Lord, Vishnupriya lay on the floor with wide open eyes, seldom able to sleep, and her bright golden complexion grew pale. She gradually became extre extremely thin, like the moon on the 14th day of the dark fortnight. While chanting the holy name, she collected a few grains of rice, which she cooked and ate. No one knew how she maintained her life. It's a very um, extreme situation, exhibition of um, in deep separation for Goranga Mahaprabhu, her Lord and Master. Now, apparently, see, this is, that's the whole point, that who can tolerate happiness and distress, who is not disturbed. So in Krishna consciousness, we know distress is apparent. It's like when uh, Srila Prabhupada downstairs in his room, we, we, we know we can hear and, and read and see videos even when Gurudev, uh, when Prabhupada lay in his last moments before he departed, how his body was so emaciated, how he became so thin. And, you know, it looks like extreme suffering. But because he's consciousness was completely transcendental you know on the highest level of Krishna consciousness he was not disturbed he was equipoised until the last moment he could speak translate Srimad Bhagavatam so that's the the ultimate exhibition of what it means not to be disturbed by happiness and distress because he was definitely not affected by any material designations. He was fully absorbed in uh, loving devotion to the Lord. So he didn't feel disturbed in his apparent distressful 
situation. So a devotee has a very different view on happiness and distress, actually. And ultimately, we can remember Srimati Radharani saying, if Krishna's, if my distress gives happiness to Krishna, then my dis unhappiness becomes my greatest happiness. So the whole point, whether in the Grihastha ashram or Sanyas ashram, is to know how to do everything, how to utilize our senses, how to utilize our situation for the pleasure of Guru and Goranga and give them happiness. And then surely they will help us uh, to make our lives, Prabhupada says here, perfect and complete. Like that. So thank you. I wanted to say so many more things, but we've run out of time. There's a, a, a beautiful story, several stories, uh, why Krishna had to take sannyas. How is it that? Because we know Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's actually Krishna himself, but come in the mood of Srimati Radharani. And that is, and you can read it, there's a beautiful, it's, there's also written in this magazine, but there's a beautiful book called Embankment of Separation, where it's described that because Krishna didn't turn up one time at the appointed, agreed hour in Radharani's kunja, and Radharani was feeling so much separation and then so much pain when Shaibya you know, uh, said, oh, Krishna is in Chandravali's kunja, like that, so causing her so much pain. And then Krishna, and she was became so sulky. And anyhow, the story goes, then they didn't allow, then finally Krishna comes running and pleads and begs and oh, excuse, again, it's very, very humble, but they, Radharani doesn't want to see him, she doesn't want to hear about it. And the Lalita and Vishaka being like gatekeepers, get out. They tell him to get out. And he's completely in distress. And uh, he get, takes shelter of Brinda Devi. Uh, you know, how do I solve this situation? And Brinda Devi says, oh, before that, it's actually Vishaka who says to Krishna, you made my pranasaki cry. One day you will have to cry and cry and cry. This is how the sannyas lila started for Krishna and coming as Goranga Mahaprabhu. So then he has to, he meets Brinda Devi, she tells him, take on this dress of a sannyasi beggar and like that. And then he comes begging for Radha Prema. And eventually there's again union and all consolation and like that. Beautiful pastimes are there. I hope you can research and find them and read them. So thank you for your um, attention this evening. Any comments or questions? Anything somebody would like to say? Yes, Prabhu? Yeah, yeah I was just thinking that uh, before coming to Krishna consciousness, as you mentioned, because of our preconceptions of what is happiness, what is distress, is in the conditioned stage, and it's quite difficult. Yes. But when we come to Krishna consciousness, Make that transition mm. from yes. the conditioned state. Yes. To the trans that's very difficult. Yes. And for each individual it's different. Yes. We all have different karmas, different backgrounds. Yes. It's difficult. So yeah, but if that's all at that point, we bring up uh, someone around us who can take us through yes. it's easy. Of course Krishna is always there. Krishna Especially if you're in a family situation where, like in my case, where I really, really want to be a devotee but nobody else is interested, then it becomes very challenging because they don't have um, the interest or the, the eligibility or the capacity to understand what you're doing. They don't. All they can see is you... You're being spiteful, you're being rebellious, 
you're not having any gratitude for everything that we've done for you and like that, you see. So uh, if, you, if you're fortunate enough to have a family, they, they are existing. I, I meet families like that and I'm always, wow, such Sukriti, you know, such Punya. And it's beautiful to see Vaishnava families uh, where there's harmony because every like Prabhupada says that because Krishna is in the center and everybody agrees to have Krishna in the center. Whereas if you're in a family situation where you have a husband or a wife even who's not interested to become Krishna conscious or your children are not interested or your parents give you a hard time, then that can be very challenging. But we, are, we, are, we stay, we're not disturbed because we have the knowledge so we know how to deal and not get upset. I want to clarify one thing. Mm -hmm. so, Mataji, you read about Bhaktivinoda Thakur's three points you said when we surrendered to the lotus feet of Krishna. Abhaya, Abhaya Ashoka, Ashoka, and Amrit. Amrit. Yes, Abhaya means there's no fear. As soon as you take shelter of Krishna's lotus feet, you're taking shelter. Krishna's lotus feet is your shelter, you're taking refuge there. That means you're completely trusting that he will maintain, he will protect, he, he will give me whatever I need, what I need. Like we, we know materially we're always satisfied, but spiritually we're always dissatisfied. So Krishna will help me whatever material thing I need, but more, more importantly, he knows better than me how to make progress in Krishna consciousness. So I trust, it's just full trust in Krishna. That means abhaya, no fear. That's why Prabhupada, abhaya charan, right? Then ashoka, no lamentation. That means you're not disturbed because you've taken shelter of Krishna. So then whatever happens, even, you know, you get very sick or you suddenly get noticed that you have cancer and you're going to leave your body. You're not going to be disturbed by that because you accept it as Krishna's arrangement. Or, you know, he gives you money or you lose your house or you get married, you don't get married, you have a car, you only have a bicycle, it doesn't matter. It's all Krishna's mercy. Like that. And then Amrit means there's not even death. And this is, it, it, actually it's nice that you're asking me about that because I had to contemplate and really think about these three items for many years to understand it a little bit better because it was puzzling to me, uh, to be honest. You know, especially like, okay, how is there no death? We're in the material world, our body will die. What does it mean, you see? But if you're cultivating Krishna consciousness, which is an eternal consciousness. Krishna is eternal, the living entity is eternal. Nitya, Nityanam, Chetanas, Chetananam, right? So Krishna is eternal, the living entity is eternal. So I've decided now to take up my eternal relationship with Krishna. So even if this body dies, I'm not this body, but I have a, an eternal relationship with Krishna. So there's no question of death in that sense, because the relationship will continue. In the material world, you know, you have to work so hard to uh, find a qualified girl to, you know, make her surrender to you, to provide and this and that, right? And okay, that, so that you can have a relationship for a while. And it's all good and nice and it has its place. But you know, it's only temporary. You know, this life, somebody is your son. Last life, it was your husband. Next life, it's your master or, you know, like that. But at Krishna's lotus feet, there is no death because your relationship is eternal. So you can feel peaceful. You can feel peaceful and then you're not disturbed. Whatever happens, it's under Krishna's arrangement. Yeah? Uh, let me say the last third point is Amrit. Mm. Nectar that is in the, in the slogan also, it's coming out of that. It's the same meaning. 
Yes, in nectar of devotion, that word also comes up. Amrit means nectar that is eternal. Like that. Yes. What are the three words? What you just said, Abai, Ashok, Amrit. <laughs> it's in one of the songs, I think in Gitavali. You can check it out. Yes, because you're taking shelter of Krishna's lotus feet. Otherwise, how can you do it? It's impossible. You know, there's so many um, meditation courses and yoga and, and, and people mean good. But in the ultimate sense, unless you know to take shelter of God, take His help, you know, place yourself, Ayinanda Tanucha Kinkaram. Please, just let me be a speck of dust at your lotus feet. And that can be any religion, but you're completely given to the shelter of the Lord because you just you recognize your position as an eternal servant, and you just want to serve Krishna. Why not? Right. The whole illusion here in this world is that we want to enjoy, that we want to be in control. But we're not controllers, we're not enjoyers. We can't even protect. You know, I think about it. I've raised children and like that. And of course I sincerely and deeply loved my children as best as I could. But in the ultimate issue, I can't love them the way God loves them. I must fail. You know, this, this, this sentence, I love you, is very dangerous. Actually, it's a lie. I might have momentarily a sincere feeling and express affection to you. Oh, you're so dear to me, I love you. And, and you genuinely mean it with your heart. But I'm very, very reluctant these days to even speak those words because I know eventually I must fail. I must come short. I'll make a mistake, for sure. Only God can really say that. I love you. You are dear to me. You belong to me. And he does. Even so, we don't think of him. We've forgotten him so many lifetimes coming, going. But he loves us. And just this book is testimony. Srimad Bhagavatam is testimony. So many amazing devotees is testimony. How Chaitanya, oh, I wanted to show you this. This is amazing. There's a beautiful picture in here. There's so many nice pictures in here. But um, there's this beautiful painting. I'll, you, I'll hand it around. There's this beautiful painting of how Krishna had to dress as a beggar and come to Radharani's kunja and beg Radha Prem <laughs> to break her sulkiness. You know, Krishna likes to be controlled by Mother Yashoda. He likes to be defeated by the cowherd boys and he likes to be conquered by his pure devotees. That's why he creates these situations just to increase the sulking as the man of Srimati Radharani because it uh, heightens their loving exchange more and more like that. So this is what we need to understand, so not to be disturbed. So right now, for example, I'm really, really so tired actually because the weather is changing, it's hot, right, that, you know, we get sick with different, different things. But somehow or other, you just think it's only temporary, it's going to go by, you know. It's, it's just a phase, so many things, isn't it? Every day something, especially at this age, Prabhu, right? At, it's, isn't it? Especially at this age, every day there's some problem, for sure. If I have a day when I'm thinking, oh, I didn't think about my body and I was just uh, absorbed, I think, oh, today was a good day. <laughs> Always something every day. Anyway, please, Prabhu, you can take this picture. Everybody can have a look. It's really nice. There's some nice paintings in there. Okay, 
Thank you. Sorry for my shortcomings, but we try our best. Hare Krishna. <laughs> No, no, nothing, nothing, nothing. It's I'm I'm actually just taking help, you know. I'm just taking help from these different slokas. <laughs>